All right, we're live. Uh, welcome everyone to Traditional Right Live. Uh, we're back from a little bit of a hiatus. John, I think every time we did a podcast, we'd say we'd do it again next week, and then it was like uh, yeah, next week, it was like months mind. before we did it. Yeah. <laughs> <clears throat> um, but yeah, hopefully we'll it'll be be time before we do another one. Um. I'm I'm joined by my co-host John and Jeff Groom, and then of course the reason everybody is going to be listening to this anyway, uh, Mr. William S. Lind. Uh, Bill is the author of the Fourth Generation Warfare Handbook, and he's the agent for Thomas Hobbes, who's the author of Victoria, a novel of Fourth Generation Warfare. How are you guys doing? We're doing well, and let me say hello to all of our viewers who used to watch my old television show, Next Revolution. They will remember we always had the wine bottle on the table in the cafe in Zurich, and <laughs> the wine was real as it's real here tonight. And somehow the show always got better as the wine what level of the wine went down. <laughs> That's how it works. Um, anyone that listened to the podcast or read the website years ago, we'll remember John and I, Jeff is pretty new. Jeff, do you want to introduce yourself briefly? Sure. Yeah. Um, Jeff Groom, former Marine officer, uh, nine years, got out in uh, April of this year and I uh, was fortunate enough to run into Bill through uh, writing American Conservative and then uh, he and I linked up and I'm down here in uh, Columbus, Ohio and uh, happy to be a part of this team. Awesome. Yeah, and thanks for joining us. Jeff also has a book out. Uh, yes. Jeff, you want to tell, what, do a little promo there? Sure, absolutely. So it's called, uh, it's a satirical novel about uh, my time in the military. It's called American Cobra Pilot, a Marine Remembers Dog and Pony Show. Um, so it was basically, it's about a lot of things uh, about cultural Marxism in the military. And uh, but it centers around an exercise we did in Korea, which is very timely now because of Trump canceling those exercises. But I basically talk about, you know, the lack of uh, focus on the mission, um, you know, filling out the rosters, and I make it funny. So the, the bend in the book is towards, like, satire. So think of it like a Vonnegut style, like a Catch-22 uh, influence type novel, but for the modern day. So, yeah, that's my book. And I'll, I'm going to be on a, a veterans panel here uh, November 15th in D.C. with Rand Paul. Uh, he's going to be headlining it for the American Conservatives. So we're going to be talking about military reform and other stuff. So Very cool. Great. Well, uh, Brent, you had some uh, thoughts pertaining to the fact that today is the 100th anniversary of the end of the First World War. Well, I, I just wanted to start by uh, introducing the show a little bit. Um, since this is the first time we're doing a, a live show, um, basically what we want to do is recap the week's news or um, make some commentary on just on recent happenings. Um, it'll, it'll be just kind of a, a casual conversation between us where we just give our takes on, on the different things in the news. Um, we'll also be watching the, the live chat periodically for any questions that viewers might have. Uh, in, in the future, you can submit questions for Q&A for any of us, but probably mainly for Bill, uh, either through the website, uh, you can email us there or just uh, put it on the live chat here uh, on YouTube. Um, in the in the future, uh, you can look for some more video content uh, from Traditional Right, and then there's going to be a, a more formal podcast too, uh, so you can look for that. Um, so yeah, getting right to it, today is the 100th year anniversary of the end of World War I. Um, and I, 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 I go ahead. Really marks, uh, it really marks not just an end of hostilities. In many ways, it marks the end of the West. <laughs> it marks the event that destroyed Western culture's faith in itself. After the Psalm, Passchendaele, Verdun, uh, the best lacked all conviction. The nihilism that now engulfs us in our society 
the rejection of all of our traditional values is a direct consequence of World War I and the three tragedies of that war. The first, of course, was that it happened. It was not inevitable by any means. And by the way, it was not the Kaiser's fault. Uh, the Kaiser neither wanted war nor expected war, as President Wilson's advisor, Colonel House, reported to him after spending a lot of time in the summer of 1914 with the Kaiser. The second great tragedy was that we got into it. That transformed our small federal government suited to a free republic into the behemoth we have now. And that was Wilson's purpose in getting us involved in that war. Interesting that he campaigned on keeping us out. He camp his campaign slogan was he kept us out of war. Within a month of his second inauguration, he took us into it. And the third and perhaps greatest tragedy was that the wrong side won. The defeat of the central powers destroyed the great Christian conservative monarchies of Germany and Austria-Hungary. The Tsar had already fallen in Russia, but a victorious some Germany and Austria would never have permitted Bolshevism in Russia. And they were in a position geographically to do something about it because German and Austrian troops controlled most of European Russia. The Allies tried to intervene against the Bolsheviks, but they, geographically they couldn't do it. But the Germans could have been in Petrograd in a week, and the Austrian flag waved them Sebastopol. So had the Central Powers won, there would have been no Hitler. There would have been no Stalin. Uh, there would have been no Holocaust or the 60 million, not 6 million, but 60 million killed by Soviet communism. And the West would not have lost its faith in itself. The victor would have been conservative Christian monarchy. Instead of the spectrum politically shifting dramatically to the left, it would have shifted further to the right. So what we're caught up in today, both politically and culturally, which is to say a colossal mess, is a direct consequence of the catastrophes of World War I. Without a doubt. So um, <clears throat> today in, in Paris, there was a big ceremony with a bunch of world leaders. Um, the the one clip that I saw was of some Afro Caribbean, probably Haitian woman doing doing a a bit a singing bit. Yeah, I saw pretty, that. pretty yeah. hilarious. <laughs> um, and then there were some speeches where they denounced nationalism as the the cause of World War One and lamenting that it's kind of coming back a little bit. Well, so. Yeah, so, so Bill, I, I really wanted to get your take on this. What, what's the deal with nationalism as the cause of World War One? We hear that a lot. Is that, is there truth to that? There is, in a broad sense, yes, but only in a very broad sense. Nationalism, as distinguished from patriotism, this is an important distinction that Edmund Burke draws, is a product of the French Revolution. Previously, our attachment was very concrete and specific and local. My village, my farm, my valley, my province. With nationalism, the country became an abstract. And again, this comes from the left initially, not from the right. This comes out of the French Revolution. Some well, these, what, what, what's abstract about blood and soil, though? Uh, blood and soil reflect that old, very specific attachment. I, uh, the distinction here, again, is between patriotism and nationalism. We're patriots as conservatives. We're not necessarily nationalists. There's a difference. The <clears throat> blood and soil are very much concrete, local phenomena. I'm not attached to soil generally. I'm attached to my soil, if you will. The <clears throat> Nationalism, as Mark Van Creffeld writes in his tremendous book, The Rise and Decline of the State, which is the best book on all of this, became a god. And as Martin said in World War I, it demanded human sacrifice on a scale that would have made even the old Aztec gods blanch. Did you prefer <laughs> a god uh, of blood and soil over the nihilism we have now? Well, any god is preferable to the nihilism we have yeah, now. Yeah, if, if, I mean, Odin and Thor and the boys are preferable to, to, the, uh, uh, to the 
the mindless agnosticism that we have now. Right. Uh, but the <clears throat> what specifically gives us World War I is not nationalism itself. It's a series of diplomatic events. Here, the best book by far is Christopher Clark's The Sleepwalkers, which I recommend very strongly to anyone who wants to understand the origins of World War I. And he makes very specifically the point that it was not Germany that brought about the war. Oh, sure. It was much more Russia than France. But the, the war was largely a result of a series of diplomatic incidents that I can trace back all the way to the Crimean War, but most specifically the Bosnian annexation crisis of 1908, where ineptitude by the Russian foreign minister Izvolsky resulted in a huge diplomatic defeat and embarrassment for Russia. And the Russian foreign ministry was very, very determined to avenge that by going to war. And so you see the Kaiser desperately trying to prevent war. I have seen the actual last telegram he sent the Tsar, in English, by the way, uh, okay. desperately trying to prevent war. But the, uh, the train ran away with everybody largely because once it starts to move, it sets all the competitive mobilization schedules uh, going, and everybody is desperate for a time advantage in mobilization. But the real origin of the war is a, is a series of diplomatic events that ultimately lead, particularly the Russian foreign ministry, to want to avenge their, their defeat by Austria, diplomatic defeat by Austria in 1908. And the result's catastrophe for the whole world. Yeah. So, <laughs> yeah, great. Um, so, World War One, of course, saw the the monarchies, the traditional monarchies of Europe, wiped away. Um, maybe sometime we can get into some more of the reasons why they more or less just disappeared at that point in time, because it seems like just the war wouldn't be enough. To, to end that period in European history. Well, I mean, if you look at the, in 1848, I mean, there was popular, you know, semi-democratic revolutions all throughout Europe that were you know, crushed in their order. So, I mean, the push towards democracy against the monarchies had been building steam for, you know, quite a couple of decades. I mean, what do you think about that, Bill? I mean, the, the monarchies were kind of on their, on their heels in a way. They are kind of on the run, would you agree? I mean, or no? Well, they had been on the defensive since the French Revolution, but right. they did a good job through the 19th century of putting the poisons of the French Revolution back in the bottle. Okay. But their destruction is that those poisons are released on the world unchecked. And again, that's what we're drowning in now. The right. war contained them was taken off the board. The three great monarchies of Russia, Prussia, and Austria by 1919, one is Bolshevik, the other two are socialist, and the great uh, ruling houses of Habsburg, uh, Romanov, and Hohenzollern are all, in, are all either dead or in exile. Uh, this is, again, a civilizational catastrophe, and it's left us in the situation we're in. The Marxist historian Arno Mayer is correct when he says that in 1914, the U.S. represented the international left, because we were a republic. In, by 1919, we were organizing the international right. We had not changed at all. The spectrum shifted around us. Okay. It shifted dramatically to the left. And okay, we're I still today trying to climb out of the hole, those of us who are conservatives anyway, to climb out of the hole that that catastrophe has created. Interesting. So we, get, we got our democracies across the quote unquote free world. And now the democracies are being wiped away by election fraud. Well, in Florida, that may certainly be the case. It looks like in uh, Georgia and I think somewhere else too is having recounts because Arizona, I think. Arizona, right. Because now they're finding tens of thousands of votes. They're just like, Pulling them out of boxes. How, how do you how do you just magically find find votes? I don't well, really know. Well, as Stalin said, what matters <laughs> is not who votes. What matters is who counts the votes. 
Right. <clears throat> and we, of course, have history tells us in our own country that ballot box stuffing is very real and can, can bring about substantial political change. 1960, Richard Nixon won the election. And the reason Jack Kennedy took office was a massive effort at ballot box stuffing in Cook County, Illinois, by the Daily Machine. Uh, that's well documented. This is no conspiracy theory. This is very well documented. It was a stolen election. I don't think Richard Nixon would have been dumb enough to get us into the Vietnam War. And the war was Kennedy's war, remember that. Pay any price, bear any burden, well, we did. Nixon, who was the most sophisticated president we've had in the 20th century on foreign policy, I doubt would have made that blunder. And after all, in the end, he not only got us out of the Vietnam War, he made our defeat there strategically irrelevant through his opening to China. Don't a lot of people think or consider LBJ to have the ownership of the Vietnam War? They do, but that's historically inaccurate. It was, it was JFK, John Fitzgerald Kennedy, who gave us the Vietnam War. And Johnson hated it. His sole interest was really? domestic policy. He hated the war, but he was stuck with it. And the establishment said, you absolutely cannot pull out of this. And, of course, the, in the end, he didn't run for re-election. Right. It destroyed him. It destroyed his presidency. But it was it was Kennedy's war, not Johnson's war, and that traces directly to ballot box stuffing in Cook County. So ballot box stuffing may very well be going on. Yeah. Yes, it's happened before. It may be going on now, and it can have large scale historical consequences. Right. Especially with we've just oh, go ahead. We, we we've got this environment of such low social trust these days now, though. Um, we just, we're getting to the point where we just really can't trust our elections. It's maybe not quite over the edge yet, but it's, it's getting very close to that. So you know, now what, where, where does this go? Well, yeah, my take, I mean, I know, right, you're talking about, you know, the democracy failing. I mean, some of the left-wing people I, I follow on Twitter just to get their ideas and see what they're thinking. You know, I've, I've seen people being upset lately about the, the Senate races. They're like, oh, well, you know, California, 40 million only gets two senators and all these other flyover states, they get two senators. This is a democracy. I'm like, well, well no, it's not democracy. It's, it's a republic. And <laughs> our designers, of I have the- They get more representatives that, though. For some reason, they don't acknowledge that. Yeah, but I, I mean, I'm, I'm thumbing through one of the old Federalist papers right now about the, you know, the, the causes of faction and how to control them. And the brilliant men that gave us our country understood that if you spread out a Republican form of government over a wide geographic area, and there's, it's hard for the, you know, the majority to get their hand up and above um, the minority, so to speak. And that's kind of the way the flyover states are. And it just makes me laugh, you know, that some of them are saying, well, we need to change things now to like make it more representative of the majority. It's like, well, that's, we don't have a democracy. We have a representative republic. And so you see that the fury from some of them that they, they can't get their way and you know, get the upper hand through the, you know, right. the process well, because yeah, the system's uh, designed that way. The whole point is to keep the cities from ruling the exactly. national politics, right? Or, or the big population states like like California, right? So, I mean, that was my take, kind of on the what I saw in the election. Is you know, I, I agree with Bill. There wasn't a there wasn't a blue wave, and the house changing during you know a Republican presidency is not something that's completely out of bounds. It happened with Bush. It happened with Obama. It happened with Clinton. Like this is nothing new or crazy. So, right. The important the important thing about this election is what did not happen. What did not happen was a repudiation of President Trump or his policies. There was, right. if, we look at the, if we look at the percentage of people voting, there was a blue wave, but it was met by an equal red wave. The, the number of people voting on both sides went up. So Yeah, this was, was the biggest midterm election ever, I think. Yes. In terms of participation? Yeah. Okay. And uh, the, that, is, that is the most important point about the whole election. More broadly, what we see from the left, what we see going on in Florida and in Georgia and in Arizona, is that the left believes the establishment can never legitimately lose. That's why they hate President Trump so much. Not because he's a conservative, which he really is. Or because he's a nationalist. They hate him because he is not a member of the establishment. 
someone who was not a member of the club grabbed the brass ring, and that can never be allowed to happen. Yeah. So the real politics today in America are not Republican versus Democrat or liberal versus conservative. They're establishment versus anti-establishment. And the anti-establishment came through this election actually quite well. That's the revolution in politics that President Trump represents. It's the, it's the seizure of power in the executive branch by, the, by anti-establishment forces. Yeah, that's what they have the most problem with. That's what they have the biggest problem with, and that was not repudiated in this election. A great many anti-establishment people came out and voted. So <clears throat> with... I think I think the left is kind of at a point where they're they're really willing to go anywhere and do anything in order to win, um, including massive election fraud. Do you think that Trump has a chance now to to win in 2020? To say nothing of whether or not uh, now that he he doesn't have control of uh, total control of Congress, whether or not he'll be able to do anything with his agenda. Do you think he has a chance? Well, does he have a chance in 2020? Yes, in theory, but a great deal depends on who the Democrats nominate. Yeah. If we're lucky and they nominate Hillary again, his chance is excellent. <laughs> and they could be that stupid. Um, among the Democrats, the people who were elected to previously Republican seats in the House were mostly very moderate, pragmatic people. A lot of them came out of for the wall and for more... Uh, immigration support as far as the as that goes exactly yeah. this was in this the zoo did not prevail in these contests among the democrats so will they nominate a white guy in a business suit who has a very moderate practical agenda well then their chance of taking the presidency i would say is pretty good yeah. or are they going to nominate a robber yeah. Well, in that case, it's four more years for President Trump. This is, of course, something we can't predict. I, as far as Congress goes, um, the Democrats have two great skunks that came tied to the package of the win in the House. First, Nancy Pelosi. What are they <laughs> going to do? If they vote against her and she wins, she will crucify any Democrat who voted against her. And she's a tremendous fundraiser, so they're all afraid to get her out. On the other hand, if she is the speaker, she is the public face of the Democratic Party for the next two years. Um, I can't... That goes well for Trump. That goes very well for President <laughs> Trump and for conservatives everywhere because she makes Hillary look good. Yeah. She is the wicked witch of the West. Uh, the other problem they have is the Democratic base will be demanding impeachment. Now, a Republican Senate is not going to vote to convict, but the Democrats are going to make idiots of themselves in, in the view of the moderate center if all they can do is issue subpoenas and vote impeachment. Right. But the, their base will scream if they don't. So they are actually in a very difficult position in several respects, precisely because they want. In some ways, they'd be better positioned for 2020 if they hadn't won the House. Yeah, they Absolutely. Yep. Yes, exactly. Trump's a meaning. Exactly. My, my take on the Democratic uh, presidential nominee is, like, I mean, we're seeing a split in the Democratic Party between you know, the Bolsheviks and the Mensheviks. Menshevik meaning less, Bolshevik meaning more, and where you know, with Ocasio-Cortez and some of these people that are openly embracing socialism against the old, you know, moderate Democratic base. I mean, if you looked at the Hillary versus Bernie Sanders split, I mean, if the Democrats are smart, they would pick someone that could maybe unite those two factions and find maybe a middle ground. I don't know. But I feel like in the American two-party system, anytime you have a third party that's similar to, you know, the one of the parties, the, the opposite party, you know, usually wins like Ross Perot in 92, where he took away votes from Bush and that gave Clinton the presidency. So the Democrats are smart. Like you know, they took down Howard Dean from within their own ranks. They knew he could never win a general election. So they took him down before he ever made it up. So uh, if they were smart, they, they're not, they're not going to run a Cory Booker or Carmela Harris or, uh, you know, Gillibrand or Warren, like maybe Sanders, but maybe not. But either way, if they were smart, they would probably going to try and run a centrist like a Biden or some unknown TBD person. 
Yeah, the question yeah. is whether the base will allow them to do that. Right. Biden would be the one to watch out for. I think yeah. Trump would have a difficult time with him. Yes, agreed. Talking about, they're talking about uh, Vito O'Rourke, who lost to Ted Cruz. Um, but yeah. interestingly, he was going to do possibly funding the caravan. So that would definitely be something for him. Uh, and obviously a globalist. Um, he's an unapologetic, <laughs> unapologetic globalist. So. Well, and he's right. already a loser. And, right. So. He lost. Yeah. I, yeah, I don't think he would stand a chance against Trump. Uh, again, I don't think he has a chance to get the nomination. If he'd won the Senate seat, he would have been one of their foremost possibilities, but he didn't. I'm not so sure. Just because the DNC is in such shambles, you know, they're, they're sending Brenda Snipes and Debbie Washerman Schultz to, to rig the Broward County elections. I mean, that's what happened in the in the midterms, or I'm sorry, the last presidential election with um, Bernie Sanders. That was the same same county that had the allegations of election fraud. So the right. DNC in general may not even be the party that puts forth a candidate, in my opinion. It could be from someone completely out of, because they might take a page from the Republicans with Trump and say, well, they, they wanted, uh, they wanted what's his face, um, Facebook, Zuckerberg. Right. But when, when all the Cambridge Analytica stuff came out, that kind of ixnayed that. But right. It'll be to see who outside the Democratic, the DNC proper, they might go with. I've actually been saying for years, including when I still worked in Washington, that there is a new model for getting a nomination. Instead of the model that Hillary followed, which she almost she got it, but it was a near run thing against somebody who shouldn't have been a serious opponent. Uh, it's instead of building up for years and years beforehand, you come in very late out of left or right field uh, as a non-politician and everybody, because they're so disgusted with all the politicians, everybody runs to you as the savior. And they don't figure out the feet of clay until after you've gotten the nomination. Right. Yeah. And I think that model is one to watch, uh, certainly with the Democrats. There, were, there, are, there are plenty of people in politics who also see this new model. And some of them are going to be followed. Yeah, yeah, that's what I mean. I, I, I don't think it's going to be as predictable in the past as far as where the nominee comes from. I agree. With the DNC being in the state it is, like I was saying, it, it's it's a you know it's it's a toss up at this point with who they're going to actually nominate. Biden is probably if they would have ran Biden in 20, 2016, they would have won. Yes. No yeah. Question about it. yeah. The dislike of Hillary and Trump was was huge. <laughs> the only question with Biden in twenty twenty is his age. That right. becomes an issue. Yeah, and and the whole video is on YouTube with him doing inappropriate things with little girls that was in the White House. But anyway, yeah. no. there's plenty of memes about that one. Bill, can I ask hey, your, what, what's your, just go Washington. ahead, Brett. That's just Washington. No, go, go ahead, Jeff. Okay, but I was just ask your take, you know, you've said many times before, I completely, before you're against something, you have to be, you can be against something, but in order to gain power and you know, get your ideas really moving, you have to be for something. For the Democrats, you know, they didn't really run, what was their agenda, like, that they ran on? It was, you know, blue wave, impeach Trump, resist, orange man bad. Like, now that they have the house, <laughs> all I've heard bad. is, yeah, you know, the NPC meme, orange man bad. Yeah. All, all I hear is, you know, we're going to do gun control legislation. We're going to try to open up more investigations. Like, what can their agenda even be for at this point? Now that Trump, in my opinion, has stolen a lot of their working class base with fighting the trade war, with the tariffs, with the tax cuts, what? Can the Democratic Congress be for and actually be popular? What they can be for is economic populism. Okay. Uh, you have two strains in populism at this point. You have the nationalistic strain and you have the economic strain. Okay. The uh, Trump ran on both. He fused the two. Yeah. And fusing the two, he got a majority. He got a majority in the electoral college. It was remember a near run thing. Right. Um, but the Republicans, as is to be expected, have performed generally poorly on the economic, uh, the economic populism. For example, right. the tax bill should have included at least a 70 percent uh, tax rate on all earned income over a million dollars a year. Now, it was politically safe. It had never got through Congress because the Democrats' phones would be ringing off the hook from their friends in Hollywood and the sports <laughs> industries. That's all earned income. Right. Republicans' big income tends to be unearned income. So it would gore the Democratic odds at least as much as the Republican. But the Republicans are just not very smart when it comes to economic populism. They, they do tend to call, they call the GOP the stupid party for a reason. Yes, it's the 
evil party versus the stupid party. This has been true in Washington <laughs> for a long time. Uh, but the, the fact is that there is an opening for a Democrat like this congressman from uh, the Youngstown area here in Ohio, whose name I forget, Democrat, who ran against Pelosi last time, should have gotten it if the Democrats had a political brain in their head. But um, if they ran him, he's a white guy in a suit from an industrial neighborhood. And if he ran on a platform of economic populism, he would be very well positioned to win. Yeah, the real question, the real question is what the Democrats decide to, to run on. If they do go for economic populism, it's hard to see. It, it really depends on how they frame it, because the white working class knows or is beginning to realize that the Democrats hate them and they want to replace them with a new voter base, uh, primarily Mexicans. Yes. Yeah. So it, it really it depends on where, how they frame that argument and whether people decide that they're, they believe it or if they're being genuine, who knows? Well, this would be a battle between economic populism and nationalist populism, if you will. And then it's right. a big question, which way are people going to go? Because you're absolutely right. The cultural Marxism that reigns in the Democratic Party condemns whites, males, non and anti-feminist uh, women who are majority by the way and um uh, and people who are sexually normal those are all evil in cultural marxism come on well, be progressive yeah. <laughs> people the people who are being called evil have begun to figure this out and can the democratic populism appealing to the resentment over wealth being more and more concentrated in this country, which is a very genuine issue, um, overcome the fact that that same Democratic Party uh, dislikes anybody who's white, male, <laughs> etc. That's That would be a very interesting contest. But again, Trump won because he combined the two. And what he needs in 2020 is, again, to combine the two. I, I have a lot of concerns about 2020 because he he spent the last two years blaming the Democrats as to whether why he can't get things done. He ran on building the wall. He made no effort to getting that done. He hasn't really shown that he's willing to do a whole lot for the voter he's, who he's asking for their vote. The problem... Yeah. Brent, is if you look at his team in the White House, what you see is that it's mostly establishment people. Right. And the establishment people want business as usual. This is true in both parties because the establishment lives off business as usual. Washington is controlled by a nexus of interest that lives off the country's decay. That's true in both parties. That is the establishment. So what he's lacked is a is a strong team in all the different ministries and so forth that is dedicated to his populist agenda. Now there are places he could have gone to look for that team. A very good place is the stable of 500 or so writers for the American Conservative Magazine. But the positions, in fact, got largely filled on the advice of poor houses like the the, Hort, the, the Heritage Foundation. <laughs> <laughs> saying for money, and um, they put in establishment Republicans who are serving the usual interest. A president can't, as one individual, uh, um, go ahead and make these things happen. He right. has to have a team. Yeah. Well, I mean, just well, look at it. He, with the wall. With go the ahead. wall, he could have mobilized the military, had them build it as a national defense issue. Uh, he could have done a number of things, but again, he can't do it alone. And a lot of those people in his team in the White House don't want a wall to be built. Remember the old bureaucratic rule that delay is the surest form of denial. Right. Yeah. I, I thought it was interesting that in the you know in this this midterm you know we've got multiple unending undeclared wars and it wasn't even like a blip on the radar. It wasn't even like talked about in like 
any of the races that I saw, or it wasn't talked about at the national level. It's just, and then here we are at Veterans Day, like, thank you for your service. Like, it, it disgusted me in a, like a lot of different ways, but also in the fact that in, in this midterm, like, it wasn't even spoken about. You know, Bill just mentioned foreign policy. It's like, you know, Trump ran on a humble foreign policy, like making NATO pay. We're not, you know, being across. I think he's doing a great job in Korea, but with, you know, some of the other ones, it's like, well, like Bill said, if he's putting in all these other people like Bolton, and then these former defense officials, like, you know, it's hard to, it's hard to get different results if you do the, the same thing over and over again and expect something else. So. Yeah. Well, I mean, we're still perpetuating a lot of the arms deal, deals in the Middle East, you know, Saudi Arabia, and, and for example, sure. there's a problem with this Khashoggi guy, because we're still so heavily involved with, you know, munition, munitions selling to the Middle East. Well, the nice thing about selling you know, <laughs> the Saudis is that they don't know how to use them, so it's meaningless anyway. <laughs> <laughs> so just unloading an expensive junk pile on them. Right. But yeah. more fundamentally, Jeff's point, and he's correct, is that Trump went. Uh, Trump ran and won as the peace candidate. He was going to get us out of Afghanistan. He was going to get us out of the Middle East. He has moved to get us out of Korea. But unfortunately, and I just did a column on this for the American Conservative magazine, is he gets buffaloed by the generals. He doesn't realize these are not military men. They are bureaucrats in even funnier looking suits than their old Soviet counterparts. And what they are about is, is career and bureaucratic and uh, budgetary politics. They are not fighters. They are not warriors. But they tell him, oh, if you pull out of Afghanistan, it'll be this huge disaster. Well, it's been a disaster the whole time we've been there, so what's the difference? But he, he, he gets buffaloed by them and he yields to them. So we have not seen his the foreign policy that he ran on. Right. To be fair, I guess it's at least good that the first step towards, you know, you dig yourself a hole, first step to do is you know, stop digging. At least he's not gotten us into another conflict. Yeah, yeah, actually, yeah, agreed. He's done good there for sure, absolutely. Yeah, but the problem is Iran. This is one yeah. place where, where President Trump is flat wrong. It is, it is... <clears throat> Very short-sighted of us to, put, uh, to to pick a fight with Iran because Iran is also a fairly fragile state. I don't think Persians are an ethnic majority. And if Iran comes apart the way Iraq came apart and Syria came apart and Libya came apart, it's three times the population of Iraq. Right. Right. And you, the real victors are the fourth generation war forces, the non-state forces that then fill the vacuum whenever a state collapses. We need to be very concerned about furthering the collapse of more states. Oh, so, I mean, we, we played a major role in the collapse. We played well, a decisive role. We did, yeah, we did yeah, it right. with both Iraq and Libya. Yeah, and it's the center of radical Islam. Exactly. It's not a good place to do it. Furthermore, if we get into a shooting war with Iran, we're thinking, well, of course, it's an easy win because we've got, it'll be an air at sea war and we can beat them easily. They will go for all the American troops in the region, both in Iraq and in Afghanistan. And in this crisis, they'll have thousands of hostages, not some dozens the way they did the first time around. Yeah. All of those American troops could very easily end up Iranian hostages. Yeah, I, I think, I think a... A, an all-out war with Iran would really <laughs> test how how it, it would really test the the longevity of the United States' ability to uh, police the world. I, I think that would kind of be the end of it. Uh, we just we we simply don't have the the means to the political will to in do this that. country anymore. I mean, po Trump no political ran. will. Yeah, there's no political will. Uh, no well, political will, no money, no. Um, we we can't keep a, the military in the field that long. We can't supply them. We don't have the equipment. Uh, it's just it, it, it's the <laughs> it would be the end. It's what President Trump. It's the opposite of what President Trump ran on. It, it'll be like Wilson. A friend of mine's grandmother voted for Wil Woodrow Wilson in 1916 because he kept us out of war. She never voted for a Democrat again her whole life because he promptly took us into it. Right. Um, yeah. Trump was elected as the peace candidate. Hillary is a wild-eyed interventionist. Oh, oh yeah. She would
in at least six more places by this point. But if Trump gets us, if Trump does a George W. Bush and gets us into a war with Iran, in addition to being a military disaster and a financial disaster, it will be for him a political disaster. I think the issue with Trump is it was clear to me, at least at the beginning, certainly from the very beginning that he didn't really know what he was doing. He's not a politician. He doesn't understand geopolitics. He has great. Um, I, I agree yeah, with Bill. He has he, great it, instincts. Ex sure. Exactly. He has good instincts. He has a good feel for what he thinks is the right path for the country, but he doesn't understand the geopolitics or the, the, the relationships that a lot of these uh, political establishments have. No, and again, this comes back to the fact that he needed a team that could take his instincts and work with them. And instead, he has a team that, for the most part, works against them because they're establishment Republicans. Right. And I think you saw with the exit with, with the exit of Bannon kind of early on, you know, I think, he, unfortunately, the what do you want to call it, the neo neoconservatives or the, you know, the establishment people, I would say, kind of got the upper hand because I know that Bannon, because of his views, was very much... Um, and if you really dig into what Bannon was saying, he's almost like, almost like a not an Occupy Wall Street guy, but a, on the opposite end of the spectrum, like a Tea Party guy. Like you know, this this system, this corporatism, or you know, big government has ruined our country, and it's ruining the military too. And I think with the exit of Bannon, I think some of the hopes for what Trump was initially his instincts were was Bannon. I think was in tune with with Trump's instincts and could have helped a lot. But how that shook out, you know, in the White House and led to his exit, I don't know. But I think, unfortunately, that marked a, a turning point for Trump. That I hope he can, you know, get his, you know, get get his instincts back. And, and another point that um, Gareth Porter, a guy on you know, Twitter that I've interacted with a little, uh, in Bob Woodward's book Fear that he just released, and you know, it popped in the media and then went back down. And but uh, he wrote an article about it and how um, Trump's instincts haven't changed. And in the book, you know, he's ranting and raving to his generals in the Pentagon about like, you know, why are we in Afghanistan? We're not winning. Why are we in Syria? We're not winning. Why we still have troops in Korea, and they, apparently they, Mattis took him to the the Situation Room or some something in the Pentagon where all the Joint Chiefs sit, and they they probably showed him you know 500 screens with all the, the operations that are happening across the world, and like this is what we have to maintain, and they calmed him down a little bit. Like Bill said, I mean Trump's instincts are what they are, and they haven't changed. It's just a matter of getting the right people in place to you know follow through on his instincts. I wonder what his instincts would tell him about Israel. That's well, interesting. Yeah. <laughs> I, I wonder if he's asked that question and we just haven't been uh, well, apparently told watched, anything like that publicly. He watched you the election. Watch, why, are, why are we involved uh, with, with Israel? Why are they our, our ally? Uh, we're, not, we're not winning. I, I don't know. <laughs> yeah. He's got his son-in-law basically controlling, Jared Kushner controlling Middle East policy. Yeah, yeah. So. Well, in addition, again, um, as Jeff noted, the neocons are making a comeback. They're making a comeback in the White House. Yeah. And, uh, and that's a disaster. Yeah. And the neocons have always been unregistered agents of a foreign power. Mm, right. And they still are. <laughs> they are the ones who lied us into the war with Iraq. As Many of them the dual strategy. citizens. Yes. Part of the strategy they had themselves written for Israel's Likud party. They're not just tied to Israel. They're very specifically tied to Israel's Likud party. They wrote a strategy for Likud that called for the destruction of every Arab state that could be a, possibly be a threat to Israel. Mm -hmm. And then the neocons mission was to make sure the U.S. did the destruction and fought the wars for somebody else's benefit. The strategy proved a disaster because what it did, again, was destroy states and create happy hunting grounds for fourth generation forces that are far greater threats to Israel than the sclerotic Arab states ever were. The yeah. Israelis have figured this out now. The Kurd and Israel are now actually allied both with Egypt and Saudi Arabia that nobody wants to talk about it publicly because the Israelis have realized too late that they desperately need states around them in the Middle East. And uh, so the, the neocons are back. They're playing the same games. And Israel's, like Trump's, big blind spot here is Iran. And the destruction of the Iranian state, again, will probably make 
the consequences of the destruction of Iraq and Syria and Libya look relatively benign. Yeah. Yeah, the, the nuclear pro proliferation is a tough sell, especially when you have Israel that has them and we tell Iran they can't. Exactly. And well, interestingly, the Iranian nuclear program was yes. not even aimed primarily at Israel. It was aimed primarily at Pakistan. People in this country don't know <laughs> Iran and Pakistan are... <laughs> Yeah, I thought it was interesting that, you know, just you read through some of the, you know, the, the background of, like, our relationship with Saudi Arabia and Iran, and we want war with Iran. Now it's like, you know, we, the CIA did a, a coup in Iran in 1953 and overthrew their democratically elected leader, you know, in conjunction with the British. But it, besides Hezbollah, like, who, what American soldiers have been killed by Iranian-backed forces? Like Ron Paul said, in, in Iraq... More Saudi fighters were killing Americans there. More Sunni Saudi fighters were killing Americans than any other foreign fighters were. And if you look the at all the nineteen Saudis, like nineteen Saudis, uh, the hijackers, yeah, the but, attacks on nine eleven, right. And then if you look at all the different groups, they're all based on Wahhabism. You've got, you know, Ansar al Sharia, Boko Haram, Al Qaeda, ISIS. These are all Sunni Arab groups that are yeah. you know, loosely affiliated and funded through Saudi Arabia. And when we're fighting in Syria, and you've got the Russians killing schwacking terrorists that are isis and people are like oh we got to fight the russians it's like what They're, are we not on the same side in this war but of course the war state ha has to have enemies and so we always have to keep the russians our enemies like bill has mentioned like we should be in an alliance with russia not their enemy but well you don't build f-35s if you're fighting terrorists in the middle east well, taliban you, you you, yeah you justify that by having to fight the russians or the chinese of, of course yeah and that's what my latest comment that I got in the America's sort of print magazine is that we have to have industrial enemies to keep the industrial, you know, military industrial complex. Yeah, exactly. Dead. So, <laughs> but yeah, yeah. This, is all, this is all the care and feeding of, of the MIG. That's all that this is about. But the strategic consequences of making China and Russia unnecessarily our enemies uh, may go beyond keeping defense contractors happy. Yeah. All right, do you guys want to add anything else to that? Or do you want to move on? I'm going to talk just a bit, Brent, about my forthcoming column I wrote today. It'll be up in about a week looking at the, the latest mass shooting, the one in California. I think that there may be a new aspect to fourth generation war showing up in at least some of these mass shooting incidents because <clears throat> the the anger building up in young men over the feminists' war on men is likely to lead to violence. The war on men has now gone so far that any man who makes any kind of an advance to a woman may find himself charged with sexual harassment and may find his job, his career, his tenure in his school, all kinds of things on the line. And the rule is the woman's word must always be believed. The man is guilty until proven innocent. And uh, suddenly guys can't do something that is hardwired into human nature. It is the norm that the man takes the initiative looking for sex. Right. It doesn't mean the woman doesn't want the initiative. But now the rules say she can want it at the time and change her mind later. And that's still valid. I think that we're forgetting that when women get really angry, what do they do? They complain. When men get really angry, they kill. And I think that the whole, again, the whole war on men that's now running through every aspect of our society is beginning to play out violently in at least some of these incidents. We know that was the case with one in Toronto. It, it was very... Right. But I think that the rage level we're seeing in more and more young men is being driven in no small, to no small degree by uh, the, the feminist war on men. So, so what's, what's the deal with the shooting? How, how did that play into, into that? Well, again, we don't know the specific motives of the shooter, but we do know that he seemed to be possessed by a general rage, and he also seemed to be basically a loser, uh, the kind of guy who's not, 
he uh, lives with mom, can't get a date. Uh, again, more, they're calling themselves the involuntarily celibate or the incels. I don't know for sure that was the case with him, but uh, there's certainly been no, uh, no mention so far of a girlfriend. And I think that this is certainly a factor contributing consciously or perhaps even unconsciously to the rage that's boiling over in these cases. I saw a statistic also... on, on Twitter that 26 of the last 27 mass shootings of the, the you know, big public ones, um, the, the, the perpetrator had no father present at home. That's 26 big, of the 27. That is a big factor. The single parent thing, but the single parent virtually always being a woman is a disaster. Every study ever done from Patrick Moynihan's pioneering work onward showed that no factor is more important for a child's future success in life than coming home every day to a married mother and father. And uh, now in the black community, 80% of the kids are illegitimate. And that figure is rising. I think it's over 50% now among whites. Yeah, I was going to say, it's probably pretty high in the white community it's, too. It's, the latest I read was it's... Uh... It's three out of 10 white Americans are born out of wedlock, five out of 10 Hispanic Americans, and 75, 80% of black Americans are born out of wedlock. And in America, like averaged, it's one out of every two kids. So it's, it, this yeah. is definitely a contributor here, um, but this also is part of the war on men. It's the notion that there's no need for a father in the household. The woman is quite sufficient unto herself. Uh, and um, this is this feeds into this, no question about it. Specifically white men. Yes, but we're, what we're seeing here is cultural Marxism, like all other ideologies, is attempting to outlaw certain aspects of human nature. Those are always the aspects that turn around and bite it in the rear. And in this case, the attempt by cultural Marxism to in effect outlaw the need for men, the, the notion women can do anything a man yeah. can do, is is turning around and biting them. Right. A lot of it's yep. just creating all duality. You yes. know, the genders don't exist anymore. Gender roles don't exist anymore. The sexes. Right. Are... And it's all pretense. We all know it's all can't, to use Dr. Johnson's favorite word. It is 100% can't. So we have female firefighters who can't carry a fire hose, and we have female <laughs> cops who have to immediately pull a gun because they can't win a fight with a guy. And you have now females in the infantry who have to be pretty much carried by the guys in the infantry along with everything else. And uh, yet we have to play along with these absurdities and pretend that somehow it's all working. And again, the, the level of male anger is rising. Remember, all feminism depends on male chivalry, which of course feminism utterly rejects and derides and says it wants to destroy. If you take male chivalry out of the picture, the guy's answer to the woman is to clock her and drag her to the cave by her hair. Uh, so the feminists, ironically, are the feminists, ironically, by trying to destroy the distinction between men and women, with trying to destroy male chivalry, are pushing things back to where the, to the Cro Magnon days. <laughs> <laughs> I'd also like to mention before we wrap up here, Brent. Uh, I, yeah, you wanted to talk about your book. I wanted to, first of all, as a good agent, must promote my author's book. This is Thomas Hobbes, the famous author of Leviathan. Uh, um, he's uh, been gone from this world for, oh, about 300 years. But uh, we did a cooperative effort here, and his latest book is out, which is Leviathan for Our Time. And uh, it is done as a novel. And anyone who is interested in fourth generation war in this country may find this a good and useful thing to read. And I also have myself a new book coming out by the end of the year, and that is Retroculture. Uh, this is a nonfiction book about how to recover the old ways of living as the new ways, the ways that have emerged out of the 1960s counterculture fail all around us. And uh, that's from Artos Press. And again, I'm hoping it will be out by the end of the year. Great. Uh, we can, we'll do a show sometime soon where we can kind of uh, talk more about retro culture and um, retro we'll, we'll, get, we'll get into it a little bit. 
Retroculture is the antidote to cultural Marxism. So a quick question about that book. I've, I've read Victoria and I, I loved it, but uh, you said it's a nonfiction book um, about retro. Is it chronologically, it takes place, you know, theoretically after, you know, the book Victoria, when, you know, the new America has been established. No, it's not fiction. It's, it's nonfiction. fiction. It's okay. Not, it, it is about how in your own life today, you can revive the old ways of doing things. Okay, so, but it's not a storyline like Victoria was. Of, no, no, okay. No, this is a how-to book. Okay, this awesome. Is how to revive the wonderful world that we had in this country from the Victorian era up through the 1950s. Okay. And lost in the, that slum of a decade, the 1960s. Yeah, outstanding. And I think there's going to be a huge audience for that. I mean, the, the, the vibe I get from people my age and people I see on like Twitter, you know, they're, they want that type of stuff. They've, they've seen that this, this society doesn't work and they're, they're lonely, depressed, angry, like misguided, and they're, they're looking for those things. So it's, I think it'll be, I think it'll be successful. The time, the time is definitely right. Yeah. yeah and, and of course, as you know, having read Victoria, the retroculture movement is critical to the events in Victoria that, that eventually enable us to recover our old culture. Yeah. Awesome. All right. So, fellas, thanks for uh, doing the first edition of Traditional Right Live. Thanks for everyone that's uh, tuning in right now and will listen to this in the future. Uh, we're going to try to get some more content on Traditional Right, more with this multimedia type content. You can look for this uh, live stream every week, uh, a new podcast coming and some more video content in the future. Um, guys, thanks for doing this and uh, we'll talk to you soon. Thanks. Appreciate it. Back with the new bottle soon. <laughs> thanks. Have a good night. Take care.